Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hi, this is Craig. Just want to let you know you can now advertise here on Everyone Loves Guitar podcast. For more information, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, everybody, this is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar, and I've got one of the sweetest blues players that I've had on the show here. We're with Anson Funderburg. He's uh, just a, just such a tasty player. I'm sure you know him. A uh, little bit about his background. Anson's dad loved country music. Every Saturday at 6 p.m., they tune into country shows on TV. That was when TV was a big deal to gather around, right? It was. <laughs> He got his first real guitar in first or second grade through a friend of his mom's along with a box of 45 RPM records, and he still has the guitar. I'm going to find out what guitar that was. Uh, he started getting paid to play in local clubs by the time he was 14 or 15. He formed the Rockets in 1978 with Daryl Nellish originally on vocals. He then met blues harmonica and vocalist Sam Myers in 1982. They made the record My Love Is Here to Stay in 84. And then Sam joined the Rockets in 1986 and played with them until he became sick and unfortunately unable to perform. Sam passed away in 2006. Anson's first record with the Rockets was Talk to You by Hand. It was released in the early 80s on Blacktop Records label out of New Orleans. In 1990, he formed a musical friendship with Delbert McClinton, who invited him to play on his Curb Records release, I'm With You. Also in 1990, Anson played with Boss Skaggs on the David Sanborn late night series, Night Music. Man, Delbert McClinton has been the sort of... Um, he's hooked a lot of guitar players up and really like done them a solid. I've interviewed probably five or six guys who that encounter with Delbert really changed their life musically. I tell you what, he's, he's been, he and Wendy have been wonderful friends of mine. You yes. know, I've, uh, he's included me on many things that, you know, like his cruise. I've, I go on his cruise every year. You know, I've played music with him. I've t toured, you know, he actually kind of, at that particular point in 1990, after we did that record, you know, he, um, we actually had the same booking agency. It was the David Hickey agency, DHA. And, um, so I actually opened a lot of shows for Delbert. And then after, you know, when Delbert's show started, I would get up and play on some of the stuff that, uh, that I played on, on the record. So it was, you know, Delbert's been a, a wonderful friend and, and, uh, you know, I mean, what can I say that people don't already, already know about Delbert McClinton? He's an unbelievable songwriter, unique singer. I mean, he's a true artist for sure. Was, um, now I'm having a, James Pennebaker, was he playing with Delbert at that time? As he well? was not. Uh, James was already gone by that time. Now James is back. Right, right. And uh, uh, Bob Britt yeah. is, is the guitar player now. Uh, but uh, David Millsap was the guitar player at that particular time. Okay. Yeah, because I know, I know James was with him a long time, then he left and he came back. Um, in the early 90s, Anson and the Rockets featuring Sam Myers, they appeared as the bar band in the Ed Harris film China Moon. And the Rockets also had three songs featured on the soundtrack. Anson's also recorded with, played with, and alongside played alongside countless musicians over the years, guys like Huey Lewis, Leroy Parnell, who I interviewed quite a way back, Hal Ketchum, and the fabulous Thunderbirds, just to name a few. Currently, he's working and touring with the Andy T Band out of Nashville, and he's also produced their last four releases. Those are Drink, Drank, Drunk, Living It Up, Numbers Man, and Double Strike. Since 2011, he's also been playing and recording with New Orleans-based music Eric Lindell, as well as being a part of Mark Hummel's Golden State Lone Star Review Package. He still performs with the Rockets, as well as Big Joe Mayer, featured on vocal and drums. One of Anson's latest projects 
was producing the, uh, a record by Danny Frankie. It's F R A N C H I. He's out of Italy, I believe. A release called Problem Child for the Station House Records label. Danny's an up and coming guitarist, vocalist, and songwriter, as I said, from Italy. And along with his lifelong love at the guitar, Anson really spent a lot of time at home and in the studio producing records. He enjoys finding all the right pieces, meaning putting songs, musicians, and putting them all together. And I'll tell you what, if you've never heard or seen Anson play, he's one of those guys when you watch him, like you're one of the guys people look at it and say, wow, it's easy to play the guitar, man, because you, <laughs> everything you do, you make it look so easy. But obviously, of course, it's not. But man, you're a sweet player and you know you don't waste any notes, man, which is really well, cool. What I do is pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, 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 <laughs> I don't think at all, man, but you make it look really easy. So, And on top of that, he looks like he's about 35 years old, so we have to talk afterwards. I need to get some of what you're taking, man. So uh, <laughs> if I look like you, I might do videos. Who knows? Hey, man, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show, Anson. Oh, man, thank you for having me. I certainly appreciate it. Hey, I know – Back in the day, a lot of people from the Dallas-Fort Worth area were migrating down to Austin to play blues and sort of hang out in that new scene down there. Did you do that, or did you just primarily stay in Dallas-Fort Worth? I did do that. I moved to Austin in 74 after I got out of high school in 72, and uh, I was there from 74 to 75. But, I, you know... I didn't really have a whole lot of success in Austin at that particular time. Um, Jimmy was down there, Jimmy Vaughn. Mm. He had a band called uh, The Storm. Uh, it was before the Thunderbirds. There was a band called Paul Ray and the Cobras. And uh, there was also uh, Angela Straley was down there working. Uh, I think I think the name of her band was Angela Straley and... Uh, Southern Feeling, which actually had W.C. Clark playing bass, or maybe, no, actually W.C. Clark was playing guitar, and so was Derek O'Brien. There was, I mean, there was several things going on down there, but it wasn't as much as, like, today, or, or even, you know, it was, at that particular time, the con the progressive country scene was sort of, you know, going on pretty strong. But uh, I just didn't have very much success down there. Anyway, I ended up coming back to Dallas and playing around Dallas for a while and then eventually started the Rockets in 78. Hmm. Did you know uh, Denny Freeman down there in Austin? I did. He was in the band Southern Feeling. I mean, yeah. not Feeling, but the Cobras. Yeah, he was in the Cobras. I spoke to him recently. He, the thing that he told me that was really traumatic was – he he said he he was down there earlier, and he said like life was just such a dramatic change between like sixty five and sixty eight. He said the whole world it was like, you know, he said sixty five it was pretty much carryover from the fifties. It had some music started to come, Chuck Berry stuff like that. He said in sixty eight everybody was walking around long hair, smoking weed, and dropping acid. He goes, it was just like he said it was crazy, man. It was just such a it was crazy. I mean, you know, there was hippie hollow people smoking pot, you know, doing drugs, drinking, going, sort of going wild. And it was kind of crazy times. That's for sure. Yeah. He, he, he painted it vividly. Hey, um, talk about Sam Myers. I was curious how you guys met and how did he influence you both musically and life wise? Cause you seemed like you had a special thing there, man. Well, Sam was, you know, like family to me. I mean, he and I worked together really. He was actually in the Rockets for 20 years. And I met Sam in Jackson, Mississippi. The, I started the Rockets in 78 with a guy named Daryl Newlis. And we were playing at a place called George Street Grocery. And, you know, back in those days, we used to do, um, in stores, uh, which we'd go set up uh, at a music store or a uh, record store and play, you know, a set of music, maybe 45 minutes or something. 
and uh, they would sell our records. Oh wow! And uh, so I, we were we were playing in Jackson at a place called George Street, and there's a there was a record store there called Bebop Records, and we were doing an in store, and a guy named Pete Cushney came in, and we had done uh, My Love Is Here to Stay, and he came up and he goes, "Man, I'm working with the guy that." that wrote that song. And, and I said, Sam Myers. And he goes, yeah, Sam Myers. That's him. He said, I didn't know anybody knew much about him. He said, but, uh, he lives here. And I said, well, man, we're, we're going to be at George street for on Thursday, Friday and Saturday night. Won't you bring, you know, you come in and bring Sam. And that's how we met. Sam came in and we got to know each other and, and we used to work at that in Jackson quite often back in the, in the late eight, you know, in the, I guess from about 84, 82, 82 on. And, uh, that was one of our, our, our stops. So Sam and I became really good friends with, you know, we'd go and stay for a couple of days in Jackson or come, you know, we were coming through Jackson, we'd stop in, see Sam and, and uh, it, it just, you know, it just happened that we, uh, how, I mean, how would you know that that relationship yeah. would grow into that? Because, you know, we we actually toured with him a little bit, even with Daryl, uh, because we, we made a record in 84 called My Love Is Here To Stay, and it's, you know, Sam Myers and Anson Funderburg, my love is here to stay. And it was sort of a little side project other than the Rockets. And we, once we recorded that in 84, you know, Daryl didn't leave the band till 86. And, you know, after we toured a little bit with Sam, uh, you know, we just kind of included him into the, um, in doing special shows and stuff like some of the festivals and stuff after we made that record. So when Daryl left the band in 86, it just sort of, a it made perfect sense. I just called Sam and said, That's, you want to come do this all the time? Let's, let's do it and move to Dallas. He said, well, sure. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was cool, man. When you said, when you were describing it just now, you said, well, tell them we're going to be there the next few days you sounded like a little kid like with that same enthusiasm you must have had i could see it oh man you back know, in the I mean, day i had i had his um i had the that 45 the 45s and and uh it, look, my love is here to stay and and sleeping in the ground i mean they were both on ace and and uh yeah i was excited to yeah to, to, to meet him I, I didn't really have any idea if he was alive or or dead or, or, or where, you know, I knew that Ace Records was based out of Jackson, Mississippi, but you know, you know, they recorded a bunch of different people and they weren't just right around Jackson, you know? So, sure. so it was interesting, you know? And I mean, it was a friendship that, gosh, I mean, it, it, it was over 20 years. I mean, I, we actually started playing over there, I think in 82, 83, somewhere in there. Um, and we met Sam on that very first trip to George Street. And, you know, man, uh, 82 to, to 2006, you know, that's what, 24 years. It's a hell yeah. of a run, man. It's a hell of a run. Yeah, well, that's awesome. Um, did he? How did he influence you, if at all, musically? Well, I mean, you know, Sam was sort of the – the real thing, so to speak. I mm. mean, so he, he really helped us, I think, um, define those last 20 years of what the Rockets really uh, were. I mean, we tried to, to do different, different things and, and tried to, to, uh, write different songs. He helped me, you know, writing and, and, and things like that and kind of giving us directions on, on maybe how things should should go which you know it, it helped us i think keep very simple 
You know, I mean, which is very easy for me to do because I'm pretty simple. <laughs> yeah, but if you it's simple music's easy to understand, <laughs> so you know it is easy. <laughs> and it seems like sometimes the the more simple something is, the harder it is to to do it because nobody wants to be simple. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's hard to be. You know, it's like somebody tells you don't. Well, don't speak. Well, it's harder to sit there and be quiet sometimes than it is <laughs> to just talk. So, you know, I think that's the one thing that we, you know, that probably all of us learned from Sam is, uh, you know, keeping true to the music. And he's one of he was one of those those guys that he loved to play, whether he was playing with us or whether he was going down the street and sitting in with with someone that was playing blues music down there, he shared his time and his music with everyone. Hmm. And, uh, you know, sometimes he was a little grumpy and, you know, he wasn't always the most pleasant guy in the room, but, (laughs) but, you know, man, he was, he was very generous with his money and with his, uh, music. That's great, man. That's great. Um, you, you're doing a lot of production now. How did you get involved in that? and, And what do you like about it? Well, I mean, I like choosing musicians, putting groups of guys together with certain artists. I mean, records sort of produce themselves. You have the right players. But, I mean, I've I, I've always sort of had my hand in producing records, all those blacktop records. I mean, uh, Hammond and I worked tirelessly on getting songs together, you know, arranging for – you know, different studios and, you know, trying to figure out the best way to, to make records and to sort of be true to, I don't know, the traditional sound, you know? Um, so, I mean, I've always sort of done it, you know, uh, but I, and I, and I, I love it, you know, I like watching things come together. You said Hammond, you mean John Hammond, I'm assuming, right? No, Hammond Scott, the okay. Scott brothers that owned uh, Blacktop. Okay, thanks. I'm clear, clarify that. Um, I don't know if you could answer this because it's it's not a simple question. <laughs> uh, you've been involved in so many different things musically, and you've had such a you know a robust career. Can you choose like maybe the top? two or three experiences that you've had and, and why you feel, why they mean so much to you? I mean, was it like your performance, the vibe, the hang, the music? Uh, or do you mean like one particular record or whatever it is? Maybe it was a, maybe it was a tour. Maybe it was a record, you know, like usually like what's your knee jerk reaction to that is probably the best answers. Like the things that come to you quickest, you know, well, I mean, you know, I love the, the the King Biscuit Blues Festival, and it is always a special place in my heart because I've I've, I've played every one of them. Uh, I think this year when I play, it'll be my thirty third time to play at that festival. Wow! Where, and where is that? It's in Helena, Arkansas. Okay. Uh, all those people have over the years, Bubba Sullivan, Jerry Pilla, you know, Sterling Billingsley, uh, you know, all those folks have become such great friends of mine. So one year we, we didn't mess up too many times, but one year we were playing in Helena and we got our times mixed up Hmm. and we showed up. Oh, I don't know. Probably 30 minutes into when we were supposed (laughs) to be on stage playing, (laughs) thinking that we had, you know, 30 minutes or an hour to get our stuff out and get on stage and play. Well, they had to shift everything. And the, the act that was in front of us or, or, after us scooted backwards and played our show and Jerry was pillow sort of mad at me. Not, not for long, but I mean, you know, he was, 
he couldn't believe that we met that we missed the show and he at one point he was he was just saying well you know you're not going to be able to play your show this year so i said well jerry i said can we just can we play tomorrow can we figure out some sort of a way to where we can we can not miss i don't care if we get paid or we don't get paid i i don't want to miss playing our show because you know we i've never missed a show i mean it and so he goes well he said i tell you what you can do you can go over to the dock you can't play on the big stage but you can go over down the street down here we have uh i think it was like a, some sort of an acoustics Style, style stage and so we i said well sure let's just do it i mean let's move ourselves we'll go down there now so they moved some things around and we went up and we sat down on the loading dock <laughs> and we played our show and the people started to come and they started to come and they started to come <laughs> and and Jerry went, well, he said, "El, I should have just let y'all stay on the big stage because <laughs> there was nobody in front of the big stage when y'all were playing down on the docks. That's great. So it's really, a, it was a really special moment. I mean, that's, that's one that, that pops out. That's a, it was, it was fun. And, you know, like I said, that's a, it's a special place for me because I know all these people and I've had, you know, a 30, 33 year relationship with them. That's amazing, man. What year was this that this this event happened? Oh gosh, Mary, I don't know anymore. <laughs> That's you know, Sam enough. was with me, so it was you know it was after eighty six, and um, I you know probably somewhere in the nineties. Gotcha. You know, there's probably pictures of it somewhere. Very cool. Anything else come to mind? Any other performance that you did or musical experience that you did that has a meaning to you, retains its? Well, I, there was there was a time when we played the Mississippi Delta Blues Festival, and uh, it looked like it was going to be terrible weather, and and it was just a sea of people. It was uh, a guy by the name of Malcolm Wall. Uh, produced that festival up there, and, and I think, oh gosh, I can't even remember who might have been Tyrone Davis or somebody. We were playing with; they were on on or Denise LaSalle, I believe, and we were playing, and uh, that festival, and it was just a sea of people, and we were playing this really quiet. We brought the band down, played a really quiet solo. And as the, as as we brought the band down, the wind started picking up, and it was just getting windier and more stormy. Looking, they ended up having to to call the night, and after by the time we got through playing, they had they had to like cut the backdrop of the, or or it would have I think the stage would have just maybe taken off. Oh, it was like a, a big storm coming in then. It was like a big storm, big lots of wind and stuff. But, uh, you know, I, the one that – the Helena thing is really the yeah. one that, that – that, that's a, that was a cool feeling to have all those people come down, you know, wanted to see us bad enough to walk down and see us at the other place that was not the, not the major uh, – stage that is very cool kind of validated your you know your being a part of that whole thing i tell you man it's been a it's been a good run there uh you know it's uh and that was the days when there was you know albert king played there uh oh, frank wow. frost um uh, uh robert jr lockwood was on it robert was on it every year too uh, until he passed away, I'm, I'm, uh, um, Sam Pine Top Perkins was oh, always. Wow. Uh, Johnny Shines played it. 
uh, left hand Frank. Now just every, you know, all of the old, the old regime of, of the blues, the, they all played that festival. It was a great, it was, it was great days. A lot of good people. You ever heard of, did a guy named Junior Kimbrough ever play that? I'm sure he did. Yeah. I know who you're talking about. Hell of a pl- that guy, hell of a player, man, isn't he? Son Thomas, uh, Son Thomas did several times for sure. Um, uh, I want to say RL did too. RL Burnside, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would imagine he did. Uh, but Son did it several times with the. Uh, Oh, what is that guy's name that played harmonica that was with him? Walter. Oh, I'm so sorry. I can't remember his, his last name. Um, anyway. Yeah. It's all good, man. Hey, you're originally from Plano. Is that correct? I am. And so Plano, I looked on the map. That's like a, basically a suburb of Dallas. It is. It, it was, uh, was a small little town, and now it's <laughs> like – it's probably got a quarter of a million people there now. Yeah, I'm sure. What was uh, what was your childhood like growing up there? Well, I grew up on a farm in Plano. When I first started to, uh, when I began first grade, um, gosh, I don't know. There was maybe six, nine thousand people in that town. Wow, that's tiny. It was a little old bitty town, and. Uh, you know, man, over the years, it's just sort of grew up. And that really probably the 70s, it just really sort of took off. It really started growing and just never really looked back. I, it's It may be landlocked by now. I, I don't know if there's, prob- there's probably no more land to be hmm. had. But I lived on a farm, uh, oh, I don't know, it was probably – 10 miles from the center of town, you know, at that particular time, maybe not even quite that far, but it was a, it was a big old farm, had two fishing tanks and, you know, cows and sheep and barns and, you know, fields. And it was so a was pretty it, cool, cool way to grow up. It was a dairy farm then? It wasn't a dairy farm. They just had cattle. Mm, very cool, man. Yeah, I always find that super interesting, man. I grew up in a, a pretty big city, and I think I would have liked to grow up in a farm. <laughs> it just seems a lot more – like this life's a lot more peaceful, a lot less stress. You're going to have stress when you grow up. You don't need it as a kid, you know? True. Uh, you know, it was – I'm an only child, so it was a little bit lonely at times. But, you know, maybe it's um, – you know, you had to use your imagination to to – to get excited about much. <laughs> well, talk about that. You got into guitar when you were like, you know, your dad used to put in, put on the country shows and then you got a guitar early on. How, like what made them buy you a guitar? They knew it was your thing or. I always wanted a guitar. You know, I had like, there's pictures of me in 1957, which I would have been three with like a little Roy Rogers guitar and the Western suit. So I always wanted a guitar, and uh, I had a cousin that was an older cousin. He could, you know, I mean, I'm, I'll be 64 this year. Probably my cousin James is, I don't know, he's probably 80, a little older than 80. So he was older than I was. But he had a uh, he had an old Harmony ah. or, or an old K. Love those guitars, man. Love guitar. And he sang and played. And he was really sort of the first guy I ever saw in person with a, with a guitar. And I always wanted one. And he had let me kind of pick around on one. He'd, you know, kind of try to get my hands on the right deal. And I mean, I could never make it work right. But, uh, but he was uh, he was always encouraging to me, and he is the first guy that I really saw in person play. So I, I wanted a guitar, and I wanted to play, and I I thought it was the coolest damn thing in the world uh, to make something make a sound like that, you know. 
And so has that, hold on. Has that opinion ever, has that opinion changed? No. (laughs) That's the cool thing about guitar, isn't it? It is a cool thing about guitar. And, you know, I think uh, there's always a part, there's always something that you hear in your head that you, you know, you'll always pick one up and strum it or try to figure some little something out or any kind of musical instrument in some way or another. I mean, I can't play piano, but I'll sit down at one and sure. try to pick something out, you know. I think music is, is something that's uh, – it, it's kind of – you kind of come here with it, I think, you know. Yeah, man, if you're lucky, for sure. Well, I, think, I, I, think, I think you can learn it. I, I do think you can learn it. I mean, there's – but I think – Music is a gift, sort of. I agree with you 100%. Yeah, 100%, man. It is a gift. What was the guitar you got, and how on earth do you still have it? You know, there's no telling how that thing (laughs) survived. uh, Because I got it, I was in probably the second grade, first, second, third grade. I was in elementary school, and my mother worked at that school. She was... uh, one of the cooks at the cafeteria and one of the ladies that worked with her, a lady by the name of Mrs. Minchie had a daughter that her husband had a guitar and they wanted to sell it. And so my mother bought that guitar from me for me. And when I, when we bought the guitar, she gave me a box of 45s. And the only thing I could figure is that they, they must have been dancers and danced a lot because there was Honky Tonk by Bill Doggett, um, Hold It by Bill Doggett, Hideaway, Kansas City. There was a bunch of Jimmy Reed records. There was Linda Lou by Ray Sharp. So it was it was all these records that were somewhere close to 120 beats a minute that (laughs) they used to dance this dance called the push. It was called the Texas push. And it looks a whole lot like, um, the shag, which still exists over in the Carolinas. I'm not sure if you've ever seen that dance or people that dance that dance. I have not, man. It's kind of a combination between the jitterbug and the Lindy hop. Okay. the, The, the man and the woman hold hands and they dance in a slot, you know, like backwards and forth. And, and the, the man is the only one that leaves the slot with the push or while they're dancing the push. And I was told that there was so many people dancing that dance back in the day that you couldn't get people going everywhere. They'd be bumping into them. <laughs> so there's like tons of people and it it's, it's a uh, it's an unbelievable dance. If you've never seen it, it's sort of like swing dancing, hmm. you know, only maybe slower. Uh, I, I wrote it ten- down and circle it in red. That means look it up afterwards. I always put stuff in red when I got to look up. Yep. Well, there's the shag. You can look at that too because people dance that to blues and beach music, which is you know the beach music would be like the Five Royals and you know the Tams and 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 that sort of style stuff too but you know it's an interesting thing you should look it up i'm going to man so you got these what kind of guitar was it it was some sort of it looks it doesn't have a name on it but it had um it was just a round hole acoustic guitar and the dots were gold glitter and so was the little small pick guard was had gold glitter on it. And I loved it. It's, I still got it. How, how did you manage to retain that? How hold I, on to it? I, you know, I was cleaning out a storage. I didn't know I still had it. To be honest with you. I was cleaning out a storage, um, two months ago, three months ago. And there it was. Wow. That must've been a slap of nostalgia when you came it, across that man. Slap in the face. If you leave me a, a telephone number, well, I don't know if I have your telephone number or not. I'll send you a picture. Yeah, of it. I would love to see that. That's pretty cool. I mean, it's nothing <laughs> special, but it's it's if 
that's number one. Yeah, yeah. That is awesome. <laughs> wow. Um, when you first started playing, were you drawn to blues? I was. Country music, blues always did something for me. Hmm. You know, I tell you what, if you, if you, in that, in that box of 45s, there was snow comb part one and two. Man, turn on, find that 45 snow comb part two. And when you hear those drums kick in, and the guitar just kind of falls in, I mean, it's, it's a shuffle and it's just, man, it's, it's, it's crazy good. Turn it up loud and <laughs> and listen to it and see what you think. And that's what I, did it for you hearing, hearing stuff like that. Hearing stuff like that, you know, watching people dance to that music, you know, back in the day when I was playing, you know, really early on when I was, you know, 15, 16 years old, that dance was still around. Probably, you know, it's, I mean, it's still around. You can still see it, but it's not, you know, people still went out, people danced, people danced to that kind of music. And, you know, to watch those folks dance is incredible. I mean, it kind of goes hand in hand with that yeah. music. It's like, watch, it's like watching an old video of, of, of people dancing to rock and roll. Yeah. Like, yeah. People throwing one another through their legs and, you know, it's just fun. Yeah. You know? It's funny at the Headhunters show last week, you know, it was all people like our age group. Sure. And it, and you had a lot of people dancing. I don't think younger people dance they as not. much. I don't know. I don't think so. I, I have like, I have to ask my kids, but, um, it was a ton of people <laughs> dancing. It was quite, it was quite, you know, funny looking at everybody dancing because you could tell this is stuff they've been doing their whole lives, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> Um, let's talk about gear since we've talked about your guitar. What's All your, right. what's your go-to guitar right now? And what other two guitars would round out your top three? Well, you know what? I've got several guitars that I've been using. They're all, most of my antique, my old vintage stuff that I bought years ago has slipped through my fingers here in the last four or five years. But I've got a guitar that, uh, Chad Underwood made for me. He's a guy that's up in uh, uh, Lexington, Kentucky, and it's a Strat, and it's the one. I don't know if you've seen any pictures of me or yeah, I have. But uh, the one with the girl on. Yeah, it. yeah, I was that's curious. That's, that's Stratocaster's one that he he made for me, and then I have another Stratocaster that's white that another buddy of mine named George Gumas made for me. So those two guitars, I, I, I play a bunch for strats. And then I've got two tellies that, um, that I, that I use from time to time. Um, one of them, uh, Steve Fazio, the guy for the, uh, the amp guy, Vera amps. He built me a, since I love Buck Owens and Don Rich and all, he built me one, a telly with the gold sparkle. Oh, this, that's very so cool. So I have one of those that I that I use, and then I have another Telecaster that another buddy of mine, Greg Henderson, from Atlanta built for me. So, uh, and the the one that Greg built for me is sort of like a Tele, like a '68 Tele, like that I had when I was a kid. So, those are my those are the guitars that I've that I've sort of been wagging around. I have an older probably a 60s um, Dan Electro that I've, it is an awesome guitar, but I, it's, you know, it's just, I haven't been taking it here lately because I've been flying so much and not driving. So. Yeah, uh, man, you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to bring oh, that. It's a, yeah. It's a good one. It looks like a butcher block and it has the two, it's not a longhorn, but it's, 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 it's got double cutaway. Oh, very cool. I can't think of the name of that. Uh, I'm going to send you a picture of it, but I don't. I'm, it, isn't it, it doesn't it have a, like a number, like a U something? Or a, Let's see if I can take a look here. Dan Electro, 60s Cutaway. 
Let's see what comes up in Magic Google. Uh, DC 59 or uh, 59M. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of them. I think there's like a, I want to D- say either, is, was it Clapton that had one that was kind of painted up psychedelic or was it Jimmy Page? Well, Cla- the only one that I know that Clapton had was psychedelic was that SG. But I don't know all those guitars, but that's that's one I do remember. Can you see that? Yeah, man, that looks really cool. I love them lipstick pick. It's like a lipstick. What kind of pickups are that? Yeah, they're lipstick pickups. Yeah, man, that looks great. So okay, like, yeah, it's like, like, like a butcher block kind of. Yeah, man. Or mica. What does that but, sound like? Oh man, it sounds so awesome. It's uh, kind of like a strat, but not, but not really exactly. I mean, uh. Uh, it's it's they have you know obviously they're single coil mm. pickups so they sort of sound like that but they you know they're hollow like they don't have wood that goes all the way through it it's just so they they have almost I mean sometimes it, it it's almost it doesn't have a lot of sustain mm. so it's it's sort of interesting it's like a bank kind of sound almost like a banjo or something <laughs> i mean i'm kind of kidding but you know what i'm saying yeah yeah i do well, let me ask you this the the custom strats that you have the you know mm-hmm. they're made by these boutique guys yes by george and chad how do they differ to like a fender if they do differ and i'm not looking for you to like slam one or the other i'm just curious about how they how they look how I they think feel they- well, they both uh, are are guys that like the vintage era, era of of guitar building, so I think that that they are both sort of um, use the the kind of lacquer and the kind of things that 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 was used in the fifties rather than than now. So they play more like a vintage instrument. I'm not saying that 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 Fender doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, or something they're from their custom shop, but I mean, it's sort of buying the same sort of thing, I guess. When you say plays more like a vintage, in what respects? Or you mean t- tone wise or feel or tone wise? Uh, and the one that Chad uh, uh, made for me, it has uh, the Ron Ellis pickups in it, which he's they're they're great. Really great pickups. Yeah, I've heard and his name several and times. Then the, and then the one that George Gumas made the, has Van Zant pickups in it. And Mr. Van Zant was great. I mean, you know, um, Mr. Van Zant has passed on. Uh, but I think his, I think it's his grandson still winds pickups hmm. and, uh, and still sells. But I think the, the I think this was made by the by WL mm. Van Zandt. Is uh, is there anybody that influenced your playing that people might be surprised to hear? Uh, gosh, I don't know. I mean, you can probably hear all of my influences. I, you know, I. But I I think if you listen close, you know that I listen to a lot of BB King. I listen to a lot of Jimmy Reed. I'm not. I think that there might be people might be more shocked at what I'm a fan of, like the Don Rich and and uh, Roy Nichols. You know, my sure. There's not a lot of country. I don't guess there's very much country in my playing. I don't know. <laughs> Definitely so, not. You're a blues guy, man, for sure. Like pretty, but pretty- I love that music. And I mean, I've listened to so much of it uh, over the years. Still do. Hmm. Huge George Jones fan, you know, Buck Owens and Lefty for sale, you know, Webb Pierce, all the older country stuff. Um, you're really good at leaving space. Like you're not one of these guys that just plays, you know, like 
you're really comfortable just doing what you have to do and not like, um, you know, you ever get these guys that don't shut up except on a guitar? <laughs> yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're really comfortable at just saying what you have to say, man, but you're saying it perfectly. Where did you get, like, is that something you developed over time or? I, you know, I've always sort of played the way I, I play. I think I've even gotten even more sparse and even more closer to the melody. I think, you know, I, I like to kind of work around the melody and I also, you know, I'm sort of an, an ensemble player. I, I like playing in a band that has you know, an acoustic bass or a bass piano or an organ. And I mean, I try to respond to the other musicians that are in the, in the, the band. I, you know, if you're constantly talking, how, how can you ever really, you're not responding to anything musically. You're just, you're just playing. You're playing a bunch of uh, of scales. I mean, I I did a little clinic out in in uh, near San Diego one time, and I, you know, me talking about music. I mean, I, I'm self taught. I play by ear. I can't read music. I don't know. I know very little about it. And then somebody was going. Well, they asked me. So, Anson, what do you think about when you're begin a solo or while you're playing a solo and i mean i and i i looked at him and i paused for a minute and i said i think about absolutely nothing um it's sort of like a i don't know what you'd you'd call it i mean if you're thinking about it i'm not sure that you're really reacting and playing music you're just playing scales, playing something that you practiced, you know, I, and, you know, honestly, that takes a whole lot of work to be able to practice all that stuff and figure out how to make it fit into what you want to do. But I mean, I'm just trying to be melodic and respond to the other instruments that are in the band. It's interesting that you said that because I watched an, uh, I've watched a number of videos of you, and even when you're playing fills like rhythm, I'm watching you, but I'm watching you, and I know what you're doing is listening because you could see it because your fills even, um, your fills are geared towards this. this they're very supportive, you know. You're not looking. You're really comfortable just doing supporting the you know everybody else there when it's not your turn to shine man and i thought that was really you know that's why your playing is tasteful you know well it i mean you, you can say shine but i mean you're shining and and playing the right thing that that you should be playing anyway mm. i mean you know, you know what i'm saying i mean if you I, I, if you should be playing rhythm then you should be playing rhythm and, and, and adding and supporting with that just as much as standing up and playing a, a solo. Yeah. It's, it's being musical is, is what I strive to do. I, mm -hmm. you know, nobody's a hundred percent, you know, I mean, you know, there's days when I walk off of the stage going, man, I've got, I, I had the, I really had the leather gloves on today. <laughs> I couldn't do nothing, right. Yeah. You know, just, it just doesn't work. That's you know? just normal. That's just numbers, man. You're doing this yeah. so many times, you're going to have a bunch of strikeouts. It's just numbers, yeah. man. That's just that's just the way it is, yeah. you know. But I mean, my my goal is to always be musical with what I'm doing and be and respond to the group that's around me that's playing, whether it and with the singer too. I mean, you know, if you just played all through somebody trying to sing well that's crazy yeah yeah why have a why do you have a singer maybe you ought to just 
<laughs> right. I, 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 man. It, it doesn't make any sense, but you know what I'm, you know I, what I'm, I say. do, I do, man. And, and, I'm, and when you just said, I think about absolutely nothing, it's, I understand and I relate to that because I have not been playing guitar too long. I've been playing about three years. That's it. I've always loved guitar. I played saxophone as a kid and I'm pretty musically talented and like I have a good ear. But sure. the thing that I like most about playing guitar is, and it's changed my life because it's forced me, because I'm like a type A personality, man. I'm super busy. I like it. And I'm always thinking. I realize when I play guitar, I can't do anything. I'm right there at that moment. I'm not yeah. thinking about, man, I got something to do on Thursday or some guy conversation or something I had with my wife. And it and it has changed my life because of that because it's allowed me to now take that sort of sense of nothing or presence and apply it to other areas of my life. And I found my stress levels gone down quite a bit. Well, I tell you, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. I, it's... Um I'm not sure what or where I'd be without music in my life. It's been, you know, it's it's something that I've never honestly, you know, hell, I still wake up in the morning going, well, shit, I wonder if I'm going to have to get a real job this week. You know, <laughs> I mean, so far so good. <laughs> so far so good. But I mean, you know, you, you still, I, I don't really can think about it and. I probably don't take it serious enough, I, you know, but it's, it's just kind of one of those things where, you know, you just, it's not anything that, that, that I planned. Oh, I'm, I, I love music. I, did I ever think I could make a living playing music? Well, I don't know. I, I, I never really, I don't know if I, I didn't, I, I won't say I never dreamed about it, but you know, I, you know, I, I read that book, of uh, that Delbert book. And I mean, in that book, he's going, he says, you know, from like eight when he or nine or 10, whenever he stood up on the, on the, on the counter and sang for all those people. And they all sort of gave him 50 cents or a dollar or whatever that he knew right then. He knew that this was what he was going to do, that this was what he that he was going to, he was going to be a singer, a songwriter, an artist or a performer, basically. And I, you know, and I've never thought of myself as that. I, I don't guess. And, you know, and I, 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 I may ask him next time I seen him that, you know, cause I, you know, I think that's probably good that he knew that. I'm, yeah, I'm, I think so. You know, I'm st like I said, I'm still wondering when, <laughs> when you have to get a regular yeah, gig, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Might be too late. Nobody wants me now. But. Well, that's a blessing and a curse, right? <laughs> hey, man, you, let's talk about your favorite uh, records. If uh, I asked you to pick your top three Desert Island discs in no particular order and just for today, man, what would, okay. what would your knee-jerk reaction be? Uh, my Kind of Blues, B.B. King. It's... Uh, it's a small band. It's no horns. It's uh, it's BB King and the Lloyd uh, Lloyd Glenn Trio. Um, that's a great record. Uh, you can if you bought that record and listened to it, you could you could see where I learned a whole lot of my playing comes from. Um, uh, Jimmy Reed really sort of. There's so many Jimmy Reed records. Um, the legend of Jimmy Reed. That's the one that has all the talking where he tells people how he wrote each song. Uh, Jimmy Reed at, at, uh, at Carnegie Hall. It's not live record, but it just says Carnegie Hall on it. Um, and all those Freddie King records, you know, he's my, num he's my number one blues hero, man. And uh, all those instrumentals, and and then how can how can I leave out? Uh, it has to be four. I mean Albert Collins. Uh, you know, I'm telling you, when I heard Snowcomb Part Two, it was it 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 blew me away. Have you have you always been a like a Strat guy? Have you ever played Gibsons? Not ever. I know you've played them, but have you ever performed with them? Yeah, I had a um, an ES5 for a long time that I 
that I carted around. And, I, and you know, I early on, I, I thought I wanted to, to play um, a 335 like BB. And I never could make them sound exactly right. But, but my first really good guitar that my, my parents bought me in 68 um, was uh, a Telecaster, mm. like a 68 Tele. Oh, wow. It was for Christmas, my, my parents bought me a 68 Tele and a, well, in 1968, they bought me a Tele and a, and a, and a custom amplifier. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, man. That's a good Christmas, man, by any that standard. Was- Oh man, it was a great Christmas. <laughs> yeah. It was great. What do you play out of amp wise now? Oh, you said your Fender. Your, oh yeah. That's yeah. Su- I, I bought that Super in 1969. It was a it was used. I paid probably $150 for it. And it was Good 1964 Lord. Blackface Super. And I still have it. And I'm still playing out of it. And it's, it is my go to amp. It's been on every record that I've ever made. Uh, I. I can't, you know, it's probably been, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's been with me through all of it. And has it needed a lot of work? You know, it, it, it looks like it needs a lot of work, but I mean, that's it, good though, man. It works just great. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's broken at times and I've taken it in and wherever we were and fixed it. I, you know, I've, I guess I've never really been a stickler for, you know, now there's all these guys that they want to put things back exactly the way they were when, oh, I, you know, and I've never, well, I've never had the ability to really do that. You know, back when we were, I was using that amp all the time. If it broke, you needed it to work. Yeah. So if I was in Champaign, Illinois, I found somebody that worked on an amplifier and took it in and they re- fixed it sure i mean so who knows what it really looks like yeah or is uh somebody that's uh i guess a vintage guitar guy he might not want that amp because there's no telling you know yeah there's no red wire in there or something yeah yeah i mean who knows a, I mean, a lot of these guys half of them are actual collectors but man a lot of them just have ocd to be honest with you and they you know, like when you have OCD, everything's got to be perfect. Yeah, man. And I, and I don't have that. Thing. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I'm just not a perfect guy. Yeah. My equipment's not perfect. My plan's not perfect. My yeah. equipment's not perfect. You know, I'm I'm the uh, poster child for humanistic sounding music i'm I with guess. you man i'm i'm i got life's tough enough being a mess you know i couldn't oh, imagine no. how difficult it would be if i had to do everything perfectly so i'm yeah. with you man trust me um hey and I, what's the most important thing you've learned about yourself throughout this entire journey you've been on about myself or for myself well, about yourself. What have you learned about yourself as far as your character or? Well, I mean, I think I'm a pretty okay guy. I'm um, I'm pretty patient. I'm shy. I don't really like talking about myself that much. I would never know from all the questions that you said, don't ask me. <laughs> no, it's, to- I- it's totally cool, man. I don't, you know, I don't, um, I don't know. I mean. Yeah, you seem super patient, to be honest with you. I was thinking that when I was talking to you. I was like, wow. Because I was, I was thinking your playing is resembles a lot. I don't know you well, obviously, but your personality seems like you're super easygoing, man. I'm pretty easygoing. I'm pretty calm most of the time. I try not to to, to let things rattle me. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fairly, I'm fairly happy with my, the way things have gone for me, you know, not, not to say that, that everything's has, you know, that everything's worked out perfect, but I, you know, I'm pretty happy. 
Hey, man, the guy who tells me everything worked out perfect, I know he's lying. So, <laughs> you know, that guy's not telling <laughs> He's full of shit. So, don't worry about <laughs> worry. Someone one time I asked him a question. I said, What, uh, something like, um, uh, have you made any mistakes along the way? And would you learn from them? And he said, No. <laughs> <laughs> I had a whole back from laughing, to be honest with you. I just rolled with it, you know. <laughs> but, uh, Never made any mistakes. Boy. It, that's pretty. That's pretty good. I need to write a book. <laughs> How did you manage to do that? Yeah, I don't know. I'll be. I'll. I'll buy it right away and read it. Um, something or someone you miss from your childhood? Oh man, I'm. I miss my. There's so many. Uh, you know, my mother, my father, you know, I, being an only child, um, uh, I had my mother and dad had had two friends. Their, their name was Milford and Velma Spurgeon. And they were like uh, a second mother and dad for me. I, you know, I. I guess I always knew I'd be all right because if something ever happened, I don't know if you ever really think about that when you're a kid, but, you know, they were like a mother and dad to me. I That's mean, really cool. I, 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 miss, I miss them every day, really. That's great. You have a good memory, man, because you've recalled, like, ne- like, first, last names, like, of events that were maybe 35, 40 years old. That's pretty pretty swift. I man. used to be a whole lot better. I, it's gotten worse over the years. No, I feel you, but you're. I think you're – do you know Reggie Young? I do not. Do you know who he is? Uh-uh. He was a session guy. He played on loads of records. And I interviewed him. And he's 81 when I interviewed him. And I, he goes, look, my memory is, isn't as sharp as it used to be. And the first question I asked him was like about his first band. And he's like, yeah, we used to practice in the XYZ store. It was located at 214 B Street. And the guy's dad was, I'm like, man, what are you talking <laughs> You don't have a good memory. Oh, my God. Yeah, I would like to meet you when your memory was better. (laughs) So um, tell me something about yourself, Anson, that people would be surprised to hear or might find a little odd. Oh, God. (laughs) I don't know what that would be, that people would be shocked to hear. Surprised to hear or might find a little odd. Um. That I like to play golf or something. I don't know. Oh, that's know. cool. That's cool, man. I don't know if that's what you're looking for or not. Or No, that's a great answer, man. You play, you get out a lot? I used to get out a, a whole bunch, but I, I don't, I haven't in the last year because I had rotator cuff surgery. Oh, just, wow. How's that coming along? Good. Now I can raise my arm up. It, it, it's, it's, it's fine, I think. That's great. You had to do the I'm exercises talking. up against the wall and stuff? Oh yeah. Got to do all that stuff. I mean, I'm still working on that. I had it, I had the surgery in December and, um, so I'm coming up here, what, next four or five months, uh, on a year. Yeah. And they, everybody says it's, it takes about a year to, to get your, to where you don't even re- realize that you had the surgery. Did you get that from playing golf? I fell last oh, year. Oh, wow. And, in May and uh, fell about four feet loading equipment out and turned, I fell backwards and turned to the left to try to, you know, to brace my fall and hit right on my sh- shoulder. I mean, I laid there, I knew I'd mess something up pretty yeah. good. Wow. Did it impact your playing? Uh, I played from May until November, the end of November with, uh, I mean, it got to the point where it didn't really hurt after, you know, a couple of weeks, but I had two complete tears. So my arm, I couldn't raise my arm. Yeah. Your problem is sleeping, I bet. A little bit in the beginning, uh, but I had to, you know, you, you, you can't, you can't just, you can't, you can't go out. Yeah. So I leaned my arm, my elbow up against my side mm. and just played like that. And I, 
if it was in F or E, I'd have to go higher because <laughs> I couldn't, my arm, this part didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't go out. I could do this, but I couldn't, I couldn't take my arm straight up and I couldn't take it. There's no way I could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you seem like you're doing great now, man. I'm really glad. Oh, fine. That's yeah. good, man. Good. Um, person who's had the biggest influence on you, both musically and personally. Oh man. Um, without knowing them, I wouldn't have to personally know them. Correct. Not, not at all. Probably BB. You know, I met BB when I was 16 and uh, a huge fan. So musically, I'm sure if anybody heard me play, they'd know that BB was a huge influence on my playing. But, uh, damn, Greg, he he set me down on the stage with him. I don't know why he took a liking to me, but I saw him at a small club. It's called the Losers Club in Dallas, Texas. It was on Mockingbird Lane. And um, he set me down on the stage with him. He sat on, in the middle of the stage. And all the people went by and shook his hand and talked to him, and he talked back to him. I mean, he was the last guy in the room. And he was talking to me while he had talked to them, and he would say something to me. And then he – I mean, he was the most gracious, friendliest person I'd ever met. And, I mean, here's this famous guy or – Somebody that I idolize, basically, I guess. Um, just uh, talking to people about their kids, about whatever, hmm. you know. I mean, and uh, shaking their hand. I'm, and just, I mean, that's how people should be treated. Man, uh, that's, how, yeah. that's how you should treat people, uh, right. you know. That's I mean, wonderful, I'm, man. Yeah, I mean, it was a uh, so I'd have to say B. Yeah, how did like did you just come over and start talking to him? Did he know you were a player or? No, he didn't have no idea I was a player. Oh, you're kidding me! No, he gave me a pick. I still got it somewhere in storage. I I haven't found it yet. It was like a I had BB King on it, and uh, so he didn't even know you played. He just he saw that you were interested in him, and he he yeah. Wow, how cool is that? It's pretty that, astounding. I mean, who knows why? I mean, maybe the I went with with the manager of my like band when I was a kid. One of the guitar. Everybody was older than me. They were all all the rest of the band were in college, and the other guitar player's mom was sort of the band's manager and booking agent. You know, maybe she said something to him that that I was, you know, that I lo- that I really was inspired by his stuff. But you know, I had she actually had to be my guardian for me to actually go into clubs and play in clubs. Mm. Yeah. So that's cool, man. Yeah. What a good experience. It was. I mean, you know, I sat I sat with him. At the at the BMAs one year, I think it was called the Handy Awards then instead of the Blues uh, Music Awards. But I sat back with him and I told him that story, and he goes, "I remember you." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "BB, you don't have to say that. There's no way you could remember that." <laughs> uh, That's uh, cute, man. <laughs> he uh, he was such a wonderful man. I met him many times over the years, you know, playing shows and stuff. Yeah. Not with him, but you know, on the same show that he was on. But what a cool guy! That is awesome, man. I've heard a couple other players had similar encounters. Everything about him. I mean, that's who he was, you know, because I've heard he, that consistently. He was the ambassador. Yeah. For the Blues, I mean, yeah, he, you know, and I mean his demeanor was just so so wonderful. I mean, he was just such a peaceful guy and pleasant pleasant man, you know. And how about non musically? Who was biggest influence on you? Uh, probably my dad, you know. 
maybe even, you know, my mom, dad, those, those four people that I sure. mentioned, you know, they, uh, they taught me to, you know, be honest, be good to people. Don't get too big for your britches. <laughs> you, uh, you know what? Um, I have found the best guitar players. I've interviewed 300 people, man, are not anywhere, anything. They're very humble, very grateful, very kind, very open. It's the stereotypical, like, excess rock crazy guitar. I haven't come across too many of them. Well, you know, man, I've been blessed and I'm very fortunate. I've been all over the United States, Canada, Europe, been all over the world playing music and man, I, I, to know as little as I know about what I do. <laughs> I think you know a lot. I think you give yourself a little pretty, short short well, stick there, it's, man. It's uh, it's pretty incredible the, some of the things that I've gotten to see because of who I am or, or because of what I do, basically not who I am, but what I do, mm. playing guitar or playing music. Uh, you know, my dad, he never really, but he never wanted to. You know, and I, to go anywhere or see anything or, you know, he was happy just being on the farm or sure or, or at home. But, I mean, you know, I have probably about the same kind of education that he had, which is very little. And, and, and I've gotten to do some wonderful things and be a part of some pretty cool things. Yeah, man. I'm happy for you, dude. Hey, I'm going to ask you three more questions, Anson. First one, biggest business or personal win and biggest business or personal disaster? Boy, you know what? That I can wrap that thing sort of up in, in the same <laughs> uh, deal. I, I mean, it just pops to my mind. I mean, none of this stuff is just are, are huge, huge. But, sure. You know, we made a record. Sam and I made a record and um, must have been – 92, 93, somewhere in there, called Live at the Grand Emporium. And it was a um, a live record. We we figured that it would be cool to do a live record. We'd set up a, a truck, we'd drive a truck up from Dallas, and we'd record three nights. And, you know, somewhere in the three nights, we would get, you know, 16, 17 songs sure. that, we could, that were good, you know, that that would be, you know, out of the three nights, if we played the same song, the same sets over, at, at some point, you know, you get three chances to get a good performance. <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> what sh should have been like a very economical way to make a record We 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 set up. We got it all ready to go, and we the first night was pretty good. Still getting some of the rough edges out, out of the recording. Well, Sam leaves at the end of the night, goes out, and he ends up the next day sick, uh. and. Uh, Stayed up all night, hanging out, goofing around, end up being sick. So what could have been the, you know, a great record and very, uh. very cheaply done turned out to be, we'd spent too much money on it to just chuck it, you know, just to give up on it. So we took it to New Orleans into the studio and once Sam was well, and he back in that in that day, we didn't have the the digital. Sure, you couldn't just punch something in. Yeah, we couldn't just punch. Anyway, there was so much bleed over because we were all on a stage, 
and everybody was, you know, playing at once. So, you know, in the vocal mic, you'd hear everything sort of. So you could hear things clip on and off if you didn't have. Anyway, he had to, we had to get him to start singing a millisecond before the original started and make it go a millisecond after his original vocal. Wow. And he had to sing probably three quarters of those songs over. Oh man. There was a few that were that that worked from the very first night. And uh, you know, so it took it went from being, you know, a great idea and a wonderful opportunity and it ended up being like a lot of people's favorite record, you know, C D or one of our, you know, CDs that I hear people say that they they love that C D, you know. And Sam got to be himself talking about somebody that brought brought him some some green tomatoes or some <laughs> crazy stuff. I mean it was you know, it was just a real kind of a cool little event. But anyway, it it, it turned out well, but it was very pricey in the end because yeah. it's a lot more money to make it than we thought. Sure, sure. But at least it was well received, right? It was. Yeah. It was. Um what are you looking forward to moving forward musically or personally? Uh, just, you know, continuing down, trying to be happy and trying to find musical projects that, uh, that inspire me or, and, you know, things to progress musically. I mean, everybody wants to be better, you know? Yeah, man. You hope anyway. And last question, Anson, what's been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that change has been deliberate or intentional and how much is just a natural part of aging? Well, I'd have to say probably not a whole lot has changed for me except for, you know, maybe I'm a little bit more calmer and that I've kind of gotten used to just accepting who I am. Maybe I don't know if you can make that. Yeah, fair. that's great. Kind of make that, that sound okay, but I mean, I you know, I, I think I've I think I've always been sort of comfortable in my skin, but I don't know. Maybe not. May you know? I'm, I've always been real shy, so sometimes it's I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I know that's the right answer for. No, that sounds great, man. It sounds perfect, and. uh Considering you're shy, man, I really appreciate you doing this interview and being so open because you're great and I'm really uh, enjoyed it and uh, very privileged to have spent the time and get to know you, man. And thank you so much. I appreciate it. Let me tell people how to find you. First of all, if you're not familiar with Anson's playing, check him out online. It's Anson Funderburg, F U N. D-E-R-B-U-R-G-H, and his first name is spelled Anson, A-N-S-O-N. Um, I want to tell you about a few projects he's worked on, but also, um, if somebody's interested in connecting with you for some production, how would they, you know, if they're interested in talking to you about producing them, how do they get a hold of you? Uh, they can get in touch with me by my email, just AnsonFunderberg at gmail.com or right. probably Facebook or you know, I am on Facebook, so they could message me there. Great. Awesome. So so if you're interested in talking to Anson about him producing you, and um, if if he's a pretty sharp guy, he's been around the block, so it would be worth your time to talk with him. I want to talk about two things that you got most recently did. Uh, first one was Andy T. Band featuring Alabama Mike. Their last album called Double Strike, you produced that. You want to talk about that for a little bit? I can. It's a cool record. Um, uh, you know, Nick Nixon out of uh, Nashville was working with Andy singing, and uh, we started that project with him. It's a, um, he ended up getting sick uh, kind of halfway through it, and then Alabama Mike from uh he lives around the san jose area kind of wait a minute san jose california how's he called alabama mike 
<laughs> He's actually born in Alabama. <laughs> okay. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm not the smartest guy, but I know Alabama San Jose. Guy. San Jose ain't in Alabama. <laughs> so anyway, we we finished, you know, the record with Mike. That's great. And it's a it's a great record, you know. And you're playing uh, on that too, right? I played on a couple of songs on it, and then the Danny Franchi one, I played on a couple of those too. Great. Did you you do any writing on any of those? Uh, we did write. Uh, I did help write on one song on the Andy T record. I did not write anything on the on Danny Frankie. That's mostly his stuff, except for a couple of covers. So check out these two records. It's Andy T Band featuring Alabama Mike. It's called Double Strike. Anson produced that, and he also produced Danny Frankie, and that's D A N Y. Frankie is spelt like Franchi, F-R-A-N-C-H-I, and he is out of Italy. And the name of that record is Problem Child. And Anson produced that one and played on a couple of cuts there, too. You can check that out on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify. Um, send in the, send Anson a check, and he'll b- send them to you or something like that. <laughs> or just go buy them. <laughs> Man, I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for everything. I, I really enjoyed talking with you. Man. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You're Appreciate welcome, you. man. You're welcome. Tell, tell tell that rascal Greg I said hello to. Man, I will. I'll be speaking to him soon. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Thanks again, Anson Funderburg, for spending all his time with us and uh, for sharing some really cool stories. Make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.